another exciting Bible study. Word up here at Shiloh Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Duncan, and we're getting ready to study the second part of a powerful Bible study. Get ready, let someone know we're on, and you get ready for part two of this exciting story. Um, the way I can say this to you is, how many of you know that there is nothing you can do to live a successful, peaceful, blessed Christian life if you don't live it by faith? What I'm about to talk to you about as we look at this biblical story that is filled with the power of God through belief, the power of God through faith, you're going to find out, as Jesus says in the passage, there is nothing impossible if you can believe. Now, we need to clarify that because there's always principles that go along with believing. It takes uh, the quality of your walk. It takes how you study, how much you read, how many times you've acted on faith in little things before you got to the big things. We, we make it seem so easy, and that's why sometimes people don't understand the real power of the word, because the real power of the word comes from the combination of your walk. But at the bottom, at the foundation of everything we do in God is faith and belief. I'm talking to somebody now who is sitting there wondering, there's no magic cures, there's no secrets I can tell you, there's no one, two, three, four, five steps I can give you, but... You can't get anything from God without faith. As we move into this study, you'll find out. Think about what the Bible says in, a, in Hebrews chapter 11. Without faith, it is impossible, verse 1, to believe God. Because everyone who comes to God is impossible. Excuse me. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things seen. We know that it is faith which is our substance of things hoped for, Hebrews 11 and 1, and it is the evidence of things not seen. But when we go to Hebrews 11 and 6, we find out what I was saying a moment ago. It's impossible for you to hear someone preach, for you to read yourself, and not have to act on God's word in faith. Remember, the Bible is about two kingdoms. It's about the worldly kingdom and the godly kingdom. All God's power is in the godly kingdom, and you cannot get to that power without faith. Hebrews 11 and 6, which says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God, because those who come to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And if you look at the all the miracles in the Bible, all of what God calls normal biblical hope, belief, and trust. We just know God is able to do these things, but you can only know that by faith. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember in the, gospel, in the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar built his gold statue, the idol, and then he said, everyone must bow down. And if you don't bow down, you're thrown into the fiery furnace. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not going to bow. But that's not the part you need to hear. Listen to the, how distinct they were, how sold out they were, how positive they were that God works. This, that only happens by faith. Here's what they said. Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to give you one more chance, paraphrasing, to get and if you don't take this chance, you're going to the fiery furnace, and who's going to save you? And all of a sudden, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, look, king, we're not careful to answer you. I don't have to think about this. I know my God that well. He said, if it be so, our God whom we serve can and will deliver us out of your hands. But I love what real faith says. If he does not, I still won't bow. Because somehow, faith is going to bring us through. That's where we are tonight. Come on, I'm, I'm getting excited, ahead of myself. We're going to pray, then we're going to read, and we're going to get into this teaching in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. But let's pray right now, because we're talking about whatever ails you tonight. If you let somebody know, these principles that we're going to show through this teaching, entitled, Before You Give Up, we're trying to teach you to make sure, before you give up, you have exhausted all of the promises, all of the principles, all of the power in the kingdom of God on your behalf, and that you did it with some joy. Let's pray. 
Father God, I thank you for everyone who has joined this Bible study. I thank you that tonight, Lord, something miraculous is going to happen because you're a God who knows what we're going through. You know what adjustments we need in our life. You know the things, Lord, that are haunting us. You know the things that are hindering us. So, God, we ask that you would work right now, God, fill our hearts with an excitement, our minds with a hunger so that we can get your word on our case. And I pray right now, somebody watching is going to get a supernatural deliverance from this Bible study tonight. And I thank you for it in advance because we know you are able. Go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, and begin reading at verse, I'm, I'm going to read from verse 14, 34, which is our text. We're reading Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, and we'll begin reading at verse 14. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. When they came to the other disciples, I'm reading NIV, they saw a large crowd around them. And the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all of the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about with them? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out that spirit, but they could not. Jesus looked at verse 19, you unbelieving generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him when the, when they saw, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, uh, can you please, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that, a crowd was running to the scene. He rebuked the impure spirit. You deep and mute spirit, he said, I command you. Come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. Let's stop there and pick up our lesson. You remember that in chapter 18, they had just asked that, Jesus had just asked the question of his disciples on the road to Caesarea Philippi. He asked them, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say Elijah, some say this. And then he said, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter made his bold confession. He said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And that's when he began to talk to them about different things. And we go from there to Jesus coming up, letting them know that you have to live by faith. So that conversation led to another understanding or opening up their eyes about Jesus' journey. Because now Jesus was teaching, if you look in our text, if you look at verse 1 of the text that we have, Jesus began to preach. So you can see that there's an and or a preposition, meaning it's a continuation of thought from chapter um, 8 into this chapter. He said, I tell you that some of you standing here will not taste death till you see the kingdom of God coming. I already told you what we explained about that is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of this world. He said, some of you which we believe that it means some of you are just going to believe me. You're, gonna, you're not going to taste death until you 
see, believe, and understand that since I'm here, the kingdom is here, and I'm bringing down all the kingdom principles and power that you need. And then comes the transfiguration. And this was so good because, as you can recall, Jesus was a man. And for his disciples to see him walking, he was always a man. But when, they, when he was transfigured, which is the word metamorphosis, they saw the bright light shining on him and he changed before their eyes. Now you put that with the fact that they had seen Jesus open blind eyes and they had seen him heal, they had seen him feed uh, five the thousands. So now you look and even though he had been a man, there was some evidence that he was God. Right? He was transfigured. The light shined. They saw Elisha and Moses talking with Jesus. You need to understand that there's some evidence. I don't know how you're hurting. I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know how the enemy is trying to rob you. But there's evidence you have where you've seen the supernatural part of Jesus. I'm not talking spooky. I'm talking about something that changed in your life. Something that has you on a path you wouldn't be on. So intervention God has done in your life. Listen to me. So intervention, some moments when you know that God intervened, you know God touched you, you know you touched God. So that should be your evidence whenever you get into another battle, into another trial. If you're going through something now, grab that moment and remember, I had to pray last time I was sick. I was down last time something was going on. But look at me now. It's evidence that God, you saw the change, not just looking at a transfigured Jesus, but there was a change in you. And when that change came in you, don't play it cheap by giving up, by breaking down, by being fearful all the time when you know there's evidence. Somebody say, I have evidence. You have evidence that God is real. But you have to learn what this text is talking about, and that is how to live by faith. Because the second time, there came a voice from the sky. The Bible said that the voice came down and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Remember that happened after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. God was trying to make us see. I don't care what else you hear. Please listen to my son. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. God is trying to speak to your mind through the word that you read, through the scripture that's in your heart. All you have to do is listen, break away from the fear, break away from the distractions, break away from the thoughts that say what could happen, and bring your mind back to say, I got to listen to what Jesus has said to me. Jesus has said, I shall have peace. Jesus has said, focus on the things Jesus said to you. Then as it came down, uh, Jesus told his disciples, don't say this to anybody, don't let anybody know what's going on. And then as they were walking, the disciples said, well, you know, people say that Elisha must come first. And that's when Jesus was able, as an aside, to let them know that everything, the prophetic ministry of Elisha was fulfilled Everything that was prophesied that he would come before Jesus was fulfilled by John the Baptist. Now, we're here. They run upon this scene. I share with you, uh, uh, I'm going to pick up from where I left off last week. I want to go back. You're going to have to go and listen to that message. But we explain to you some of the things, the background, the foundations that leads us to know what's happening here now. I'm talking about the principles, not just the story that I just related to you. I share with you some things like Jesus never fails and you can live by faith. All of that, go by and see. Because that plays into this Father giving you some direction. Don't miss it. For how you must act before you even think about giving up. So the text says, when the disciples came down, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers arguing with them. One of the reasons not to give up is because you have to realize that you have a special relationship with God. Now, I got, I got to break this so you understand. I have a relationship as James Duncan. Everybody has a relationship, but God is so selective so entrenched in his love for each one of us that your relationship is special to God. When you re don't remember the anointing, you take away that, uh, that specificity that says, 
I am somebody in God. He has a plan and a purpose for my life. And my purpose is not to go down now. I'm not giving up now. So with all the things that have happened in my life, there's an accumulation that says God knew all of those things and he's using every piece of those to bless me. Remember that when God chose you, he had a special relationship with you. And so the words, when they came down, are significant because remember, he took his inner circle with him and that inner circle was Peter, James, and John. Now imagine, Everything that he had for Peter, James, and John to do that we're going to find out is because he took them in his inner circle. He gave them the things that they need because in the relationship they had with him, that's what they needed. If you got sick with what's coming down the road, with the relationship you had for God, God had to teach you how to trust during that sickness so you'd be ready for where you are now. If you had a child that was going to be wayward. Maybe God allowed there to be a problem in the house between you and the child. And you saw something in that child's nature that you knew were going to, was going to get him in trouble. So it made you pray early. Or maybe something happened in your body and you knew God will tell you. I know I've got a witness out there. God will tell you. He will warn you through the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. And let you know something's not right. And what God does, he uses all of those things to bless us. The Bible records that there's three incidents where Jesus took Peter, James, and John. I love this, so that they were not only uh, part of the inner circle, but that was the relationship that he had for them. Don't be jealous of what someone else has, because God has a special relationship with you. You're the one that has to look for that relationship. What am I saying? Remember when he went into J.R.'s, his daughter? He put everybody out the house. I love the text because Jesus put everybody out. Sometimes you got to put folk out if they're going to hinder your blessing. You say, well, I want to act Christian. No, I'm going to be a good Christian, but I'm not going to let you rob me of my miracle because unbelief comes out of your mouth. So what he did with JR's daughter, when everybody said she, you know, she's dead and he's not going to be able to raise her. He only took Peter, James, and John inside that house. The second time was, remember when they went to the Garden of Gethsemane? When they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples went. But the text that says, and he went a little further, I love it. There's some places everybody can't go. But because of your special relationship, know that God is using you. Because he's already built victory in you to make it through this situation. I said that again because that was God. There's victory in you. Somebody talk back to me now. Just say, there's victory in me to handle what I, I know it hurts, but you got to say there's victory. How do I know? Why in the world would God choose Job when Job is said was the most upright man during that time, and yet God chose to take everything away from Job and allow Job to be sitting in sackcloth and, and ashes, just messed up from head to toe, losing everything, and yet Job still had the wherewithal, the forethought, because he trusted God. He lived by faith. He didn't know what was going on, but he said, God lives, God take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job did some stuff that some of us would not do, but then again, if you remember the preamble to that book, Job was also the one God said, have you considered my servant Job? That is an honor. It doesn't feel like an honor, but it's an honor because God will reveal to me what he already placed in me by taking me through the situations that I'm going to. Maybe God's trying to reveal something to you. What you need to do is honor God by worshiping through your situation, by making sure that there is some joy and praise on your lips as you're going through the situation. And the reason we shout it through is because in the end, God's going to work it out. And then the last time, of course, was this transfiguration. God uses everything he can to bring us to a place that our relationship is secure. He uses testing. We love the verse in James, right? Uh, God, I don't need a test. Some of us don't like tests, but tests reveal to us several things. They reveal to us how strong we are, but man, they also reveal to us how strong my God is. If I just hang in there and take the test. 
uh, James, uh, the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into divers, many temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith, that word trying there is the word testing, will work for you uh, 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 patience. It produces faith, and faith produces patience. And let patience have her perfect work that you may be mature that's what the word perfect means and entire wanting nothing God said I test you so you can grow up I test you so if you cried last time in this situation you won't be lost and hopeless now because you've seen me deliver you before sometimes the test in our lives if we can just make it through the test God is the one who will bring us to a point of victory but we just have to be able to stand the test God uses testing. I like the fact that God uses reversal. Write this down. God uses reversal. What's reversal, Pastor? Reversal is when God takes a bad situation, turn it around for our good. Um, it was really, really a bad situation, and we had to go through the bad situation, but he turned it around for our good. Romans 8, 28. This is Bible study. When God tells us, and we know, there's the faith again, and we know, you got to know that all things work together for our good. I know it doesn't feel like it uh, when we are called according to his purpose. I love that. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Special relationship. And then last, he uses hope. I love this. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says this. These little troubles, you know what I mean, we're getting into, are getting us ready for an eternal hope that will make all of our troubles seem like nothing. Whenever I read that text, and God says, for this light affliction, King James, you're familiar with that. I'm saying, God, this is not light, but he said it's working for you. A far more eternal way of glory. There it is again. So God said, when they came down, he had used them because they had a special relationship with God. And you need to realize that they were, what happened to them? Well, look what happened because of that relationship and because of their walk. Remember Peter on the day of Pentecost? All the men were speaking in tongues. It was Peter who said, men and brethren, just because you see these men acting drunk, they're not drunk in the book of Acts. He said, this is that. Peter then, it says that he led 5,000 in Christ. Many times in the book of Acts, Peter, and rambunctious, impulsive Peter, because God had taken him through all these situations where he had to smack his hand and tell Peter, I still love you, but he took Peter through all this stuff. Not only that, James was, according to biblical history, he was the first martyr to die. That means because of what he went through, he was able to die for his faith in Jesus Christ. And the reality is, faith really isn't faith if you won't die for it. Somebody say, what does that mean? I need you to go with me to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Go to Hebrews 11. I, I started not to do this, but this text is so significant that you need to see it yourself because it gives us a better understanding, chapter 11, of faith. And when we understand this, we know the blessing of God. I'm going to pick up um, at verse 32 of Hebrews 11. Read this with me. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fire of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received their dead back to life. There were others. Now here's the part I want you to see. All that good stuff. I love that pastor. People being raised from the dead were able to, you know, conquer kingdoms. That's all. But he said also there were others who were tortured refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better res resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, whippings, even chains and imprisonment. 
They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. Stop right there. Understand, when you sense the reality of your spiritual existence, you're going to be a target. And sometimes your very existence is to stand through and leave a roadmap for someone else to follow. That's why God said we ought to have a testimony. You need to leave a roadmap. I was fearful. I was hurting, but I refused to give up. And yet I suffered for not giving up. There's the moments you're going to suffer for your faith. But remember, at the end of the day, your faith will yield you a blessing. It doesn't feel good while you're going through it. Ask Job. But at the end of the day, he got a double portion. These folk, the blessing they received was not they received some material or, you know, some financial, some worldly thing. The blessing was they received that connection with God that they stood in faith. Can you imagine what's going on in glory right now when God knows what you're going through and yet he sees you standing by faith? That's a better reward than anything you could get on this side. I know it does not seem like it, but the, but the perks, the benefits of getting that close to God is a strength that cannot be denied. And then we keep going. We said, I'm sure verse 15 said, as soon as they saw Jesus, they was overwhelmed. I told you, you can't look Jesus in the face without being overwhelmed. But then this man, who is the character of our story, the main character, said, I bought my son to your disciples, and I bought him to you, God, because... You know, he talked about the demon running around in them. He said, but they could not. Let's look at they could not before. Contrast. The inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the Bible says, when they came down. Came down from where? Being with Jesus. That meant that if there were 12 disciples, nine were left. So that's the ones who the people looked at and expected to be able to bless. It, it is something, it's like when Jesus went by the tree and saw no fruit on the tree and he cursed the tree because the Bible said the tree had leaves. Many of us have leaves but no faith. Leaves but no fruit. Your, your, your Christian response is you, you, you can criticize other folk. Uh, you know how to do church. You, you dress Christian. You put all the right Christian sayings on Facebook. You take all your shots. You look Christian. All your lingo is Christian. But if somebody came to you for fruit, there is no fruit where you stood by faith trusting God. That is the problem. God is saying you're missing the main reason you're here. And that is to test and taste the supernatural. What you're going through should drive you to a place of expectation by faith that says I am more than my problem. But they went to these disciples. You know, Jesus spread fame has spread abroad. So they got to these disciples and they said, well, he's been with Jesus. Surely he has power. Question is, do you? But as long as you've been with God, do you have the power to be able to handle what's going on in your life? Because those three words, they could not, was really, really bad. Why? Did you know there are other times in the gospel where Jesus, when he sent them out two by two, told them, you know, knock the dust off your feet, go evangelize. They went from house to house. Do you know they came back to Jesus and said, we are rejoicing even the very demons are subject to us. I'm saying that because sometimes you forget you've already overcome this area. But when you lack, or those words get into your spirit, they could not. It's because somewhere along the line, you've lost some spiritual power. Somewhere along the line, you may be just living off your reputation. You don't pray like you used to. You don't read like you used to. You don't seek a higher level with God as you used to. And you're wondering why this problem got you down now. It's right there in the text. Please look. They, they had cast out demons. Seemed like they should have done it. They saw Jesus do miracles. They stood right there. Jesus explained that it was by faith. But there were several things that happened to him. I need you to write this down. Lack of spiritual power. We face a world system. We face 
a strong demonic spirits and we face a flesh that is fallen. We got all these enemies against us and wonder why we just don't stay charged up all the time. No, what we have to learn how to do is understand that I lack spiritual power unless I stay connected. We're still talking about building that relationship, right? And if you don't, you'll find yourself drifting to the problems of you're a Christian, but your mind is all tied up in materialism. It's tied up in, you know, how many views and likes I get on Facebook. So you bring yourself and you put something in, in, in a, you know, that is against or juxtaposed to God. And you make, and you try to live both of those lives in one spirit. That's why some days you have more spiritual power than other days. Not only because you're prayed up and you read more, but because your mind has been centered on, you know, this is what my world is about. It's about God and not all these other things. But it's easy for a believer. Here's the hard thing. There are believers out there, and I hope you're not one. It's almost oxymoronic what I'm about to say. I call them, there's believers out there that aren't going to go to heaven. That's really not true. There are people out there who think they believe, but will forsake the faith, which shows they never believed. I'll say it again. Everybody talking about... Did they lose their salvation? I'm not going to get into that today. What I'm going to share with you is this. There's some people, you know, when God said you can't pluck me out of your hand, sometimes we can't pluck, they can't, outside force can't pluck us out. But if we forsake the faith, it shows we never really were a believer. Biblical. I don't have time. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. We're, we're, we're going to go back and look at that. What I need you to see if you go to Colossians verse 4, verse 14, it talks about demons. And the verse says, was one who fell because he loved the world. He had previously been faithful, but he fell because he loved the world more. One of the things that hurt me in my heart, if you don't know about this, I love, I used to love to read um, the apologist, Rabbi Zechariah. Rabbi Zechariah was the world's leading. He would go into debates with all of the uh, leading atheists and come out with spectacular. Um, he, he knew the word and where it needed to go, and he understood other philosophies that were surrounding it. It's a word we use called epistemology. He understood all of that and could bring us back to the place to say, but well, God exists, and this is what you can't deny. He had atheists not denying Jesus, but look. When he died, we found out all of the skeletons in his closet. This is a dangerous place I'm at right now. Because we like to tune in to places of blessing, but we need to also tune in to places of sanctification. How can I make sure I've assured up my faith in God that the enemy can't trick me, the flesh can't turn me off, and nothing in the world will seem as great as God. When you saw Hillsong, one of the greatest mega churches, and they had, you know, music out. When you saw that Carl Lentz was caught in an affair that he lied about, and then it came totally out. Multi-million dollar pastor, multi-member uh, uh, church, and here he is now, in preaching every week, but he fell. Don't you ever think you're not at a place where they'll look sometimes, there'll be some days when you're going to say to yourself, I just could not. Could not means that I'm not there and you got to get back. So the first thing you got to worry about is this, this world. You know, make sure you uh, put a blockade in your mind. And then Satan also will foul us up. Like what happened to this young man? You're going to find out as we read further. When uh, Jesus came, the devil flipped him over and started acting up because that's what the enemy does. The enemy tries to scare us. We have to be prepared. 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be diligent, for your adversary the devil goes about as a growing lion, seeking whom he may devour. That word devour has an interesting connotation. It just does not mean he will totally destroy you, but he will destroy your walk. He can shake your faith. He'll get you to the point where being with, with the Holy Spirit inside of you, you'll be powerless. 
because your mind has been taken over by those spirits. And then not only sat satanic opposition, the one that I always tell every believer to look out for, when Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, uh, when I would do good, evil is around me, quit lying, all of us, some of us don't want to accept that we can fit into that conversation, but it seems like the good that I would do, I don't do, the evil that I don't want to do, I know that happens because we're working, we are fallen creatures, we're, this flesh sometimes overcomes us, and that's why we have to make sure we don't stay falling down. Romans 7, 14, 15, for we know, Romans 7, 14, 15, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Every believer, shouting believers, pastors, bishops, apostles, I don't care who you are, if that relationship is not strengthened constantly, you're going to find out even now you're still a slave to sin. I know he broke every chain, God set me free, and we want to talk about, look what God did. I'm not talking about God right now. Don't even try. I'm talking about, look what you did. Can you be honest with it? Look at the things you let in your mind. Look at the stuff you think about. Look at the things that the enemy can press through and sometimes you can press through. I know we want to say everything is the devil, but man, you must have forgotten how evil and dark and that this uh, human mind can be. Even though I know, you know, at the time I'm doing this Bible study, that horrendous, horrific, um, you know, crime of the five officers beating young men to death. Even when he was Looked like he was brain dead or unconscious. They're still striking blows. That is demonic. But it wasn't the devil that showed up that, that led everything. We got to know that this flesh that they were leading opened up the space so that they could do that. I don't care how saved you are. If you don't put your flesh under, underneath you know, your feet, if you don't try to make sure that I got to make sure this flesh follows what I know about God. And it's hard. And somebody say hard. And that's why you sit around sometimes, uh, can't sleep. You sit around, fear comes from everywhere. You say, man, I was just shouting in church on Sunday. Or you, you know, pray for somebody in a prayer. It seemed like it came down from the angels of heaven. I just prayed anointing down. But now I've got to wrestle with my own thoughts. That's the difference. That's what takes us to this man. He was so powerful. This man's son was possessed. He said, Jesus, I bought my son to you. Your disciples, they couldn't do it. Jesus said, okay, show me where the boy is. But first, we didn't look at, look at a picture of this man's life by faith. This man's son was possessed by a devil. For a long time, important. We, we can handle the things that are for a short time, but some things will be ongoing for a long time when we got to stand in faith. For a long time, somebody say long time with me. Understand, it's not, you know, an outlier position to say, I've been going through this for about four or five years because God expects us to know we're in a battle. That's the battle you have to fight. Don't be upset, my brothers and sisters. I have my battle. She got her battle. He got his battle. The devil wants you to think nobody else got battles but you. But this man was still standing. That's faith. Because this had been happening, but he, he, if we can look at what he did in his text. He went to seek Jesus. He saw his disciples. Jesus wasn't around. And the Bible said when he ran up on them, they were arguing. You don't know what they were arguing about, but because the Bible doesn't say, but think about something. He was arguing with the religious leaders. It's not hard to believe that what he was arguing with, with them about was how powerful Jesus is. And, and they were probably telling him, why are you trying to bring me to Jesus? That doesn't work. And he was arguing with the religious leaders. Religious leaders had a place of respect and they demanded. And sometimes it was silly what they wanted. But this man was not afraid when it came to his son to argue. And then he started arguing with the crowd. Because remember, you got to know the crowd. There's one side Howard. When Jesus came down, there was a crowd all over. Then he started arguing with the disciples. Why couldn't you do this? Here I am arguing about how powerful Jesus is. I go to his disciples and you can't do anything. And then he goes all the way to Jesus. But what you need to see, he did all of that before giving up. Powerful. He did all of that before he decided to give up. Verse 9, Jesus said, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? 
How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. I like this because Jesus was speaking um, or the, let's go back to the man for a minute. This man, this father, Jesus is so intelligent. God is so purposeful. God can see so far down the line that I know at that moment he couldn't compliment him, but he enjoyed this man's faith because this man was listening to Jesus say, first of all, this is an unbelieving generation. Don't listen to them. Sometimes you got to make sure you don't listen to the unbelievers. Don't let someone else's hang up steal your joy or steal your blessing because they don't believe. There was a discourse between Jesus and the Father, Jesus and the crowd, and Jesus and the disciples. Can you see the whole picture? They all came down and argued. All of a sudden, Jesus come in, and when you see him, they were overwhelmed. They had to be quiet. And then all of a sudden, this Father told a story, and Jesus said, you unbelieving generation. What does that mean? He said, the strength in the relationship that I see, because at this point, you got to know, he knew this father's heart, right? And so Jesus tells us, we will never get to the point of having enough strength not to give up and enough strength to continue to trust him until we trust his word. Oh, I'll write this down. Uh, if you could write it somewhere, I trust the word of God. I've been in some bad situations where I spoke a word and it looked like my situation got worse. Anybody ever been there? But then I figured out when I looked back over my life, those points, those, those uh, uh, powerful points where I stood and spoke the word of God, the word of God outlast the problem. Well, that's good. The word of God will outlast your problem if you trust his word. Why? Because God's word is a destructive power. Hebrews 4 and 12. Oh, somebody needs to hear that tonight. For the word of God is as a living, I'm reading from the ESV, so I'm reading it. The word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, of joints of the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces the joints and the bones and the marrow, meaning that God's word functions in the natural world. And in that, that word, when it gets inside of you, cuts through anything that's trying to stop you. What you need to do is find a word about what you're going through. Come on, quit playing. We get to the point, how these disciples got to the point that they could not, is because they did not treasure and value this very word that we can read anytime we need to, to strengthen ourselves. And how does it come? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I love Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. So this man was hearing Jesus call him an unbelieving generation. And he was not just talking to the Gentiles and the Pharisees who were trying to live by the law. He was even talking to his disciples. Verse 20, so they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, stop. When the Spirit saw Jesus. Now last week, I shared with you a few of the um, demonic spirits. I think we left off with that, that we would have to be confronted by. Now understand, I, I said that we can never be possessed but we can be harassed, controlled, um, our emotions lowered, depression, spirits. We can be so messed up, it's almost as bad as being um, possessed. But let me go back over. I want you to write this down because I want you to see these spirits that um, you can actually have to worry about. Let me get out of here. Yeah. All right. So write these five spirits down. Uh, that every believer has to deal with. Remember, uh, it, it, this is not a spooky, but it says, uh, Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle. I talked about that last week. 
But we are so against principalities, powers, rules of darkness of this world, right? Spiritual wickedness in high places. So the first spirit we have to deal with is a lying spirit. 1 John 4 and 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Very simple. A text tells us the only way you can know the spirit of truth against the spirit of error is that you know God and hear his voice. But if not, the devil will lie to you. Everything the devil says is a lie. He lied to Eve in the garden. He lied to David. He'll lie to you. So when you hear, don't act, and he'll try to make you think the lie or the thought of the lie is coming out of you when it's not coming out of you. It's coming out of the enemy who is fighting against you who doesn't want you to wrestle back. But all of us have to make sure we don't deal with a lying spirit and, I, you know, it just happens. We got to make sure we correct that with truth. The next one is that we have to deal with is the spirit of pride. Um, Proverbs 16, 18, 19. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Watch this. Pride is one of the worst demonic spirits ever because everything I'm teaching, I had somebody who no matter what scripture I would read, they would say, yep, that's right. I heard that, I read that. Like, everything I was saying, it took me 15 hours to dig it up. Now, I'm not talking about just one sermon. Every sermon, they could say, yup, that's right, that's right. Some of the stuff, I had just never forgot. I'm not saying I'm the smartest person in the world. But when I hear people preach, because of the illumination of the preached word, I get something out of it. And when, what I get out of it is not, I don't sit in front of, uh, you know, somebody else preaching. I know that. I wonder who that is. No, God said a little child can lead them. You have to start learning how to sit and not let your pride get you to a place where you can't even receive the help you need. Because the pride spirit will destroy you. And this spirit can be found among a lot of destitute people because they, they, they're unteachable. Um, they got too much pride to take help. They found themselves destitute and homeless and helpless and sitting around all because of their pride. The next one is, and you know this, we wrestle with the spirit of fear. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Many of us know I've encountered fear face to face. Uh, when I started preaching, you don't know the times I walked out to, to the pulpit, right? You got your words, you got your Bible in your hand, you got all this knowledge going through your mind, but that fear going through your spirit. Or you're riding down the road and there will be a spirit of dread come over you for something that hasn't even happened. God says, wrestle that spirit. Of course, the spirit of infirmity. Spirit of infirmity. Um, Luke eleven thirteen. We know this one. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, was bent over, couldn't lift herself up. And God said, woman, thou art loose. Now, every sickness is not caused by the devil. Remember that. Remember that. No, this human body is getting old. As it gets older and declines, all of the things that take place within your body means that you're getting older and it's harder to do things and sickness is a part of life. But the spirit of infirmity, we have to look out for. And lastly, the spirit of bondage. It's there. It's there. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry out the Father. Somebody right now needs a rebuke, cast out, get your thoughts out your mind, if something is trying to hold you in bondage. This spirit is the precursor for addictions and obsessive disorders and compulsions. And, and what he tries to do is make sure that you're not strong enough to handle what was going on in that life. So God said, Jesus said, let's be back up again, verse 21. Jesus asked the Father, how long has this been going on? Jesus said, from a child, often it throws her in the fire. So you need to know the enemy is going to always be with you. Often they throw it in the fire. He, he went through the storm. What, what he was saying is this behavior, um, 
I need it. I need my child to be better. I need him healed. And the man said, uh, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And that's when Jesus said, all things are possible if you believe. All things are possible if you believe. Uh, now, sometimes they put a guilt trip on you saying, well, the reason they have because you didn't believe it. No, sometimes you're in the middle of a battle that has to work itself out. Um, you think Jesus wasn't a believer, but he still had to go through the three tests when the Spirit drove him to the wilderness and the devil came upon him and said, cast yourself down, make the rocks turn to bread, bow down to me. All of that was a testing. Job had to go through. So understand when we say all things are possible when you believe, we're letting you know that your power of belief can make these things happen. Immediately the boy father says something. Here's a blessing. I do believe, but help my unbelief. He was saying, look, I do believe, but there's some doubts that I need to get out of. Uh, my, my, my faith and my belief is here, but can you help the areas where I don't believe? Okay, okay. I guess somebody look at me now. There's no areas in my life where I don't believe. That's not true. All of us. This is the stuff you're going to be confronted with that you didn't know you were going to be confronted with. That got a witness that will make you know, I thought I believed I could handle that, but I need to get some word. I need to pray. I need to go somewhere in my own secret closet. I need to go somewhere and pray in the spirit. I need to build my faith up so that I can handle that and make sure the words that I have, I can put into action. This father said, I want to live by faith. Trying to live by faith, there's some areas where I have not believed for the right thing yet. Or I don't know if I can believe for that. Come on. There's some of us that can believe God will pay the bills, but you don't believe God will help you when you're in the hospital. Uh, you don't believe God can overcome that diagnosis. There's some people that believe God can come and give me peace, but you don't believe God can take the prayer that you pray and bless your child's mind so your child can get some relief while your prayers are covering them until they walk in the path that God has for them. I know there's some areas that there's some things where I said, if I would have believed for them, I would have had them. Let's look at some words of faith that tell us we need to know how to believe. Luke 17 and 6. This is how, this is how precious, how available God has made the fact that you can believe. Whatever you're going through right now, my brothers and sisters, you can believe for healing. You can believe God for it now. You're in it now. The spell was in it. Sun rolling around the fire. Sun being thrown all over. But he still heard the words of Jesus and had enough sense to say, help me in the areas where I still need to believe better. I need to be stronger. Is there anybody out there? I need to get better. Did you hear me? There's areas I'm real good, but other areas I need to get better. And so Luke 17, 6 says, and the Lord said, if you have faith, as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up, and be thou planted in the sea, and it will obey you. 1 John 5.14 And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is where we're going to pick up next week to go into a full understanding of what changes, what, how this man's words touched heaven, the strength God sent down, how a situation that felt, looked, had every intention of being a disaster was turned around by the man saying, help thou my unbelief. We're going to look at how to get to that point where you can expect a miracle. Because the latter part of this text, especially when the disciples say to Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? You're going to find out there are some principles in here that will help you say, I can handle anything. If you got somebody sitting around you say, you better listen to this before you give up. You know, you got to make sure you increase your spiritual 
power. Don't walk around when the power is available, not having it. Well, we thank God. We've got one more week in this text. We've got about nine more verses to do. When we get through those nine verses, you're going to find out that I have in my arsenal some substance for my fight. I know what to do before I give up. Well, if you want to, uh, please think about contributing or giving to this ministry. Um, this ministry is focused and centered on the Word of God. Um, we have, as you know, we deal with from our um, outreach programs, we have, of course, the food pantry, but we also have a place where we give diapers to, you know, young mothers who are runaways who need it. Uh, we go and visit those in nursing centers to bring them things. We also have a celebrate recovery program. We have programs that are changing people's lives. So please, you're sitting home. God has given you. He only blessed you so you can give it back. Think about giving into our ministry here at Shiloh. Uh, all you got to do is go on to www.shilohbaptistchurches and press the give button. You can do PayPal. You can do Givelify. Um, you also can do Cash App, uh, dollar sign, Shiloh, J-A-D. You can send instantly with Chance Cash App. And also send us your prayer requests. When you go online, there's a place for you. Leave us a prayer request. Call the church and leave a prayer request. We will make sure that we greet you. So this is Pastor Duncan saying see you next week. Don't forget, we have all kinds of exciting Bible studies here. Every morning at 8 o'clock is an encouraging word. Go to Facebook, SBC Praise Church, hashtag. Or go to YouTube. We are, we are making sure that people's lives are being changed. God bless you.